Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, hallelujah is a Hebrew word. Hallelu means praise the, and Yah is short for Yahweh, which means Lord. Hallelujah simply means, hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. So that's what we were doing just a second ago. All right, I want you to pull out two things. Pull out the message notes for this weekend in one hand, and if you have a cell phone, I want you to pull it out in the other hand. Okay, both of these. I want you to have two things in your hands, the message notes and a cell phone. Now what I want you to look at first is your cell phone. Don't answer it. (laughs) If you have a smartphone, you hold in your hand more power than NASA had when they put a man on the moon. There's more power in one little cell phone than we had in existence when uh, America put a man on the moon. You have more technology in your hand. Let me show you what the first hard drive looked like. Look up here on the screen. That was it. That was five megabytes of, uh, of storage. Not very portable, about the size of two men, several thousand pounds. Now, that's five megabytes. In your phone right now, you have a minimum, even if you got a cheapy phone, You have a minimum of a thousand times that in your phone. And you can buy 10,000 times that and put it on your phone. You have no idea how much power you have in your pocket. That's why in 2007, Time Magazine named the iPhone, that's the year it came out, this. The invention of the year. Now since that's happened, it's been renamed because the cell phone, the smartphone, is by far the most behavior-changing invention in the history of mankind. Nothing else comes close. Not the wheel, not fire, not the steam engine, not the automobile. Nothing comes close to the power of this little invention. Why? Because like with a car, you can do maybe 10 different things with a car. But with this, you can do thousands of things with this. Thousands, literally thousands of things with this. You can have it direct you to the right place with GPS. It's a, it's a uh, you know, travel device. You can listen to music, obviously entertainment. You can check your heart. You can do all kinds of uh, uh, studies on your body. You literally can do thousands of things. When they decided to put a computer in a phone, it changed everything. Hundreds of thousands of people in the world, hundreds of millions of people in the world own a computer, but billions own one of these. And that's their computer, and it's the access to everything. Now, when this came out, and it's only been a very short time, less than a decade, that it really changed everything, uh, daily life and daily habits radically were altered. You don't live the same way you did before this came out. Uh, You know, before the smartphone, people actually listened to a phone. Now we look at a phone. By the way, I'm taking a picture of you right now. There you go. (laughs) I'll put that on Facebook, you'll all be rock stars. Everybody looks at the phone instead of simply listening to it. That's a major change in your behavior. In fact, we look constantly at our phones. Let me show you some images. We, list, we look at our phones while we're waiting. You ever seen a picture like, ever seen that happen? It's everywhere. Everybody's got their head down today. They're all looking down while they're waiting. We, um, we look at our phone when we're going to work. Look at this. Okay, now, let me, there's an interesting, I put that picture up there because there's an interesting story behind it. I got this out of a Boston newspaper. These guys are going to work on a train elevated train or I don't know what it was, subway, and uh, a guy walked in, pulled out a gun, and nobody noticed. (laughs) He put it back in his pocket. A few minutes later, he pulls it out again. Nobody pays attention. He puts it back in his pocket. A few minutes later, he pulls it out a third time. Nobody's paying attention. He put it back in his pocket, gave up, and walked out. 
because they were so distracted by one of these. Uh, we now look at these while we're eating. Here's a typical family meal. <laughs> family of four, they're all looking at four screens. Right there, that's family fellowship in the 21st century. Everybody's looking at their phone. Uh, we we uh, constantly look at our phones while we're walking. Have you ever seen this? <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. Now, because of this one invite, uh, we are more familiar with the heads of people, the top of their head, than we are their face. Because people are walking around like this all the time, so you recognize the top of their head rather than, than their face. Of course, we use these in the bathroom. You don't get a picture of that. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right? Uh, we even look at this screen while we're watching other screens. Here's a family watching TV. And they've all got, you know, because you can't be bored during the commercials, so we're all looking at our screens while we're actually on the sofa watching TV. And then, of course, uh, even take them into the bedroom and we watch in bed. Now, this couple should be doing something else. <laughs> but they are, they're looking at their screens. Now, the latest statistic, this is the most recent uh, statistic, is that people check their phone every 12 minutes on average, every 12 minutes. That means you look at this little screen 80 times a day if you're an average person, 80 times a day. And that, all that change has just happened in about a decade. We have to talk about the implications of the power, both the upside and the downside of this uh, in your life. Now, because everybody looks at their phone on an average 80 times a day. Even famous ad personalities want to get involved. Here's the corona man. I don't always look at my phone, but when I do, it's because everybody else does. <laughs> and that's the most mysterious man in the world, if you know who I'm talking about. Now, the other good news is that if you're painfully shy, you're one of the people who's always worried about everybody might be looking at you, and you're worried, is everybody looking at me right now? Relax, nobody's looking at you. <laughs> nobody's looking. Do you remember uh, years ago, there was a song that came out that says, you should dance like nobody's watching? Do you remember that song? Dance like nobody's watching. Well, here's, here's the truth. Dance like no one's watching because everyone is on their phone, so no one is watching you. So you can act like a total goofball, nobody's gonna pay attention. A guy can pull a gun out and you won't even notice. What is amazing, as I said, is that all this change happened in, in real, literally just a few years, um, in just a decade. I, had, I have to share this with you. This is on the internet. My kids asked what it was like growing up in the 80s. So I took away their phone and turned off the internet. <laughs> That's it. That's the 80s, folks. All right, that's the 80s. <laughs> this church was started January 1980. That's the 80s. No phone, no internet. That's, that's how different it is. Now, if you're going to spend that much time looking at this the rest of your life, we need to deal with it as a spiritual issue too. So I want us this weekend to look at being a disciple in the digital age. How can I use this for good and how can I minimize uh, the negative parts of it, okay? And I really wanna do a couple things. First, I want us to understand some of the downsides. I don't have time to go into all the downsides, but some of the downsides in this technological power that you hold and you actually carry it with you all the time. You, so you actually carry with you a new source for old temptations. The temptations have been around forever and ever and ever. New source for old temptations, but you carry it with you in your purse or, or your pocket. And then I want to look at <clears throat> five ways to use your smartphone for the glory of God. So I want us to begin by looking at the spiritual hazards uh, uh, of digital tools. We all know what the upside is. This is an amazing tool. It gives you access to the entire world to the body of knowledge that's out there. And it's just, it's hard to explain, explain how powerful this, this tool is. But there are spiritual downsides. And so let's look at the spiritual hazards of digital tools. I'm talking about iPhones, iPods, smartphones, uh, laptops, any, any device that connects you online 
uh, to the internet. All right? By the way, what is a hazard? Well, if you're a golfer, you know what a hazard is, but a hazard is a potential dangerous trap. If you're walking through a minefield where they buried mines in the ground, that's a hazardous field. And if you step on a mine, it'll blow you up. By the way, I like to keep you guys up to date. So as, a, as your pastor, if you're a golfer, the word hazard is no longer acceptable after 150 years at the golf course. You probably don't know this, but I do. I'm going to tell you. In January 1, 19, uh, 2019, all of the powers that be in golf, the L, uh, PGA, LPGA, and all of the other golf associations that govern golf, uh, took the word hazard out of the official manual after 150 years. So they're no longer called hazards. Now, in golf, there are two kinds of hazards. There's water hazards and there's sand trap hazards. But now, uh, sand trap hazards are simply called bunkers. Everybody knows what that is, a bunker. And, but water hazards are now going to be called penalty areas. I'm not making this up. I just didn't want you to be embarrassed the next time you played golf. <laughs> Don't use that word because it's now out of date according to the official rule book uh, of golf. Some of you, that's all I needed here. Go home, okay? <laughs> now, I said that you carry a new source of old temptation uh, in your pocket or, or in, your, in your purse all day long. Let me just give you six hazards you need to be aware of. Okay, write these down. We'll go through them pretty quickly. Number one is it can waste my time. I can waste time on my cell phone. Everybody agree with that? Yeah, of course. Time is your most precious commodity. You only have a limited amount of time. If you are an average human being, you will live 27,375 days. 27,375 days. That's the average number of days a human being lives on earth. Uh, if you're over 27 years of age, you've already passed 10,000 days are behind you. And the problem is you're not getting those back. Time is your most precious resource because you can't get it back. You can't get any more of it. You can always get more money. You can always get more energy. There are a lot of things you can get more of. You can create, but you can't create more time. You have a certain number of days in your life, and that's it. And when you've spent it, it's gone. So life management is really time management. If you learn to manage your time, then you'll learn to manage your life. Now, here's what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Be careful how you live. Don't live foolishly. Instead, live as wise people, making every minute count, because these are evil times. Now, notice it says be careful how you live. You might circle that word careful. We don't use the word careful like they did in Bible times. Today, careful has an impl implication of you're worried about something. Be careful. Watch out. Don't, don't fall off. Be careful as you walk down that, that area. It has a, a, this is not a, what it's saying here. The opposite of careful is careless. Careless. He's saying don't be careless with your life. Be careful. And that means be intentional. Around here we call it being purpose driven with your time. That you're, you're intentional. You're deliberate. You know where you're going. You're not wasting your time. You're not careless with your time. You're careful with your time. Now, the latest stat on these smartphones is that in America, you spend, since you look at it 80 times a day, 3.4 hours a day looking at your screen, at your phone. 3.4 hours a day. That adds up to 24 total hours a week you're looking at this thing. And what that means is if you are an average person and you live to an average age, you will eventually spend 11 solid years of your life looking at this. 11 solid years looking at this screen. Now, that means we need to talk. Because I'm interested in you not wasting 11 hours or 11 years of your life. And by the way, that doesn't include watching TV, that's another screen, and that doesn't include uh, video games that you play that aren't online. That's just being online through your phone. The Bible says this up here on the screen, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Now, you may say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful or beneficial. A thing may be permissible, but not everything 
is constructive and encourages growth. This is a Bible principle we need to apply here. What is it saying? It's saying some things aren't necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. They're not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. It's not a sin for you to spend five hours watching cute kitty commercials on, uh, you know, on YouTube. But it might not be the best use of your time. It's not a sin. It's not evil, wicked, mean, bad, nasty. It's just like some things aren't necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. And you need to say, is this worth me giving my life for? I just gave my life scrolling through a bunch of clickbait. How many of you, I wonder, have, when you were dead tired, instead of going to bed, you're sitting here scrolling through with your thumb, you're barely awake, and you're going click, click, click. Click and yeah, yeah, that was funny. No, that wasn't. Yeah, that was funny. No, that wasn't. You know, you know if evolution were true in a hundred years, everybody's gonna have giant thumbs, okay? Because they're exercise. So giant thumbs, big butts, little feet. Because we don't walk anywhere anymore, okay? And, and, and they're just scrolling on. We'll look very, very different, okay? But but how many times have you needed to go to bed and you wasted it on looking at stupid stuff on the internet, when really what you needed was sleep? And then you paid for it the next day because you spent a lot of time looking at stuff that didn't matter. The Bible says this on the screen, Proverbs 12, verse 11. Only a fool idles away his time. So we know, I don't have to teach you on this one, we all know it's easy to waste time uh, on the internet. Okay, let me give you a couple of others. Number two, a second hazard is I can be seduced by the world's values. I can be seduced by what the world values, the world's value system. Because the internet, and particularly social media, amplify stuff that is not important and make it seem like it's really, really, really important. And it's not. The world and all the advertisers in it are constantly telling you how to think, what to buy, how to feel, what's cool, what's not cool, what's hip, what's not hip. The world is constantly shouting at you through the internet, and you're carrying it with you all day in your pocket. Now, that's not a temptation previous generations of followers of Christ had to deal with, because they weren't carrying it with them, but you've got, you're carrying advertising with you everywhere you go. And the world's value system of passion, possession, and position, or sex, salary, and status, that's what the world's after. And, and if you listen to it long enough, you start thinking, well, that must be right. And that that must be okay. And you carry that voice with you. Whatever gets you, gets your attention. And if you look at something long enough, you know what's going to happen? You're going to start copying it. And you're going to dress like that. Uh, You're going to act like that. You're going to think like that. You're going to feel like that. Whatever you look at all the time, you're eventually going to copy. That's why the Bible says this in Romans 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Okay, he says, don't don't copy the world's value system. What are the world's value system? Look up here on the screen. 1 John 2, 15 to 17 says this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, well, hang on here just a minute. Let me stop. The guy who wrote this, John, in 1 John 2, 16, he says, if anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's the same guy who wrote John three sixteen in another book, which says, God so loved the world. Okay, which is it? I mean, come on. In John three sixteen, John says, God so loved the world. And in 1 John two sixteen, he says, don't love the world. Well, what am I supposed to do? Looks like a contradiction. The answer is in the definition of the word world. In John 3.16, where it says God so loved the world, he's talking about the people of the world. We are to love the people of the world because they were created in the image of God, they have dignity, we are to love every person. In 1 John 2.15-17, to he's saying don't love the value system of the world. So the Bible says we are to love the people in the world But we are to hate the world's value system because it's anti-God. Love the people, hate the value system. 
The problem is we do the exact opposite. We hate the people and, and we love the value system. We, is, we are as materialistic as everybody else. We're as interested in sex and pleasure and uh, uh, living for fun and living, uh, you know, making that the highest goal of life. We're as interested in status and, and salary and sex and popularity and possessions and power as everybody else is. We get it backwards. Now look at that verse again. Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For what the world values, and the world has three big values, the lust for constant pleasure, that's called hedonism, the greed for more things, that's called materialism, and the prideful positioning to appear important. That's called secularism or humanism. It says, I am God, I'll be my own God, I don't need God, I'm more important. He says of these three things, none of these things come from your father. The world and what it values is going to pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. So you gotta choose. Am I gonna go with God's value system or am I gonna go with the world's value system of you know t- the temptation to have more, the temptation to feel more, the temptation to be more, all of these kind of things that happen. He says, if you're hearing people shout at you all the time that you gotta be popular and you gotta be beautiful and you gotta be successful and you gotta be rich for you to have any value, that's a lie. It's a lie. It's the world's value system that only the wealthiest matter, only the most beautiful matter, uh, only those who are having the most fun matter. That means you don't matter because you're not in any of those categories. But that's what the world is constantly teaching. You gotta be thin and beautiful and sexy and rich, otherwise your life sucks. That's the world's value system. They are wrong, but you're hearing it all the time and you're carrying it with you in your pocket and you're reading it on social media and things like that. If I see it enough, I start thinking, well, it must be okay. And what, 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 what this does is this desensitizes me to sin. It desensitizes me to sin. All of a sudden I think, well, if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. It must be all right. James 4, verse 4 in the Bible says this. Don't you know that to be a friend of the world is to be hostile to God? If, you, if your aim is to be popular with the world, you make yourself God's enemy. I didn't say that, God does. He says, you gotta choose. Do you wanna be a people pleaser or do you wanna be a God pleaser? I highly recommend that you decide from this day forward, you're not gonna be a people pleaser anymore. You're gonna be a God pleaser, because if you're a God pleaser, it will always be the right thing to do, and actually, there will be some good people who like that. But if you be a people pleaser, you're gonna be stressed out and insecure your entire life, trying to please the world and its value system. It just doesn't work, all right? Let me give you a third, third hazard. I can be drawn into unproductive arguments. Oh, baby. This is very, very easy, particularly in social media. Have you ever heard somebody say something really outrageous and you got offended really quickly by it and you thought, well, I need to tell them off. I need to set them straight. I I need to respond. And, And you want, every bone in your body wants to just obliterate them because what they just said. Like you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, you've, you've read stuff online and you go, that is so wrong, that's just not right. And they attack somebody I like or love or whatever. And, and, and it's an easy way to get drawn into an argument. I understand how you feel, but don't. Don't respond when those arguments start up on, on the internet. Here's what the Bible says, Titus chapter three, verse nine. Never, that means never, never get involved in foolish controversies, useless arguments, disputes about your personal pedigree. That means, uh, you know, issues about your family history, your ethnic background, your genealogy, that kind of stuff. Don't, don't, don't get in an argument over that. Uh, or fights over interpreting God's law how you interpret a particular, all of these, God says, are useless and do not help anyone. So it's pretty clearly, don't get involved 
in, in fights and arguments. That would apply to the internet too, not just at, at the office. The fact is there are people who live to hook you. There are trolls out there who love, their adrenaline goes up when they hook somebody for a fight. They don't even care with what you believe. They just like to fight and they like to argue. And, and you think, well, I'll set them straight, but they're using motivated reasoning, which means no matter what you say, it's not gonna work. And finally, you're gonna, after about, I don't know how many times you respond to them back and forth, you're finding that this is, real, it's, this is worthless, it's not going anywhere. They're not gonna change. You're not going to change them. They just like to fight. And, and, and if they throw something out that's very, you know, um, threatening or, or, or provocative, and, and they throw that out, and then you respond to it, they go, ha, I hooked a live one, I'm gonna reel them in now. And now they've got somebody to fight with because they don't really feel alive unless they're mad. It's a problem, it's a mental problem. They don't feel alive unless they're mad. And they're gonna just roll and hook you in. Now here, let me show you some verses about this on the screen. Proverbs 26, 21. <clears throat> Just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a troublemaker keeps an argument going. They're not gonna let you off the hook. They're gonna keep on arguing until you give up. They're not gonna give up. So he says, don't, don't do that. What does God say to do with those kind of people? Here's what he says on the screen. Proverbs 26, four. Don't answer their foolish arguments or you will become as foolish as they are. You'll, you're gonna look as dumb as they do. Just don't get hooked. Now, I highly recommend that instead of worrying about what other people think, whether they think it about you, what, what they think about you is none of your business. What people think about me is none of my business. Uh, it it doesn't, doesn't have any degree of influence on my happiness. Don't be worrying about what other people think. Instead, here's what you should be worrying about. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said, you can be sure that on the judgment day, you will have to give an account to God of every careless word you have ever spoken. Uh-oh. That includes one written in social media and on the internet. One day you're gonna give an account of every foolish, useless, mean, and what other words that you use on the internet or anywhere else, you're gonna give an account to God. Now that ought to be enough to muzzle my mouth and zip my lip. But not only that, now you know this, whatever you say on the internet is permanent, global, and searchable. It's never going away. Which is why you need to teach your kids, don't do that, don't say stuff on the internet thinking it's no big deal because when you're in the ninth grade or 10th grade, you think, well, I can say that and I'm just mad at so-and-so and then 50 years later, they're gonna pull it out in your Senate hearing. <laughs> it will come back. And so any employee can look up anything you've ever said on the internet. So it's not only gonna be, not only is God keeping a record, so is the internet. And it's permanent, it's global, and searchable. So zip the lip. What causes us to get hooked into those kind of arguments? Well, in a word, it's ego. It's ego. When Kay and I got married many moons ago, uh, the first verse, Bible verse we memorized together, we memorized a lot of scripture together. I would highly recommend you do that with your spouse. Well, the first verse we memorized, we memorized it on our honeymoon because we needed it on our honeymoon. We were having conflict on our honeymoon. And Proverbs 13, 10 says this, pride always causes conflict. Pride always causes conflict. Anywhere you find conflict, it's because ego's involved. I want what I want, you want what you want, neither of us want to back down. When my pride hits your pride, that's what's causing the conflict. Now, a good dose of humility is, is what you really need to do before uh, you, you, you go online and you pick up that phone. All right, number four, let me give you another one. Another uh, hazard of uh, a smartphone is I can be tempted to compete and show off. I can be tempted <coughs> to compete and show off. 
Now, we always want to put ourselves in the best light. We want everybody to think our lives are perfect. We want everybody to think we've got it all together. And what happened is this new entity called social media is a place to show off. That's what it is. And when I go on social media, whether it's Instagram or, or uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or any, any of the ones that are out there, LinkedIn or any, whatever's out there, um, I always want to put my best foot forward. You, you never put a, post a picture of yourself when you just got out of bed, okay? And there's drool coming down your you know, cheek here. And, and you can smell the body odor on you. And, and, you know, there's laundry over in the corner. No, no, no. It's my so-called perfect life. And Instagram reported that over half of the pictures posted on Instagram are photoshopped. They're correct. They're, they're not reality. They, they, they are, I want everybody to look uh, good. And so I want everybody to see how cool I am. I want everybody to see how smart I am. I want everybody to see how rich I am. I want to see how everybody, how happy, how fun I am, how perfect my marriage is, how brilliant my children are, and people are actually showing off through their kids and grandkids. Boy, it got quiet. <laughs> and, we, and look how loved we are. Look how loved I am. That's just showing off. And, and, and because of that, uh, the worst kind of showing off, you know what it is? God hates this more than any other kind. Spiritual showing off. When you're trying to appear spiritual in front of others, it's called self-righteousness. It's the sin that Jesus hated in the Pharisees. He said this about the Pharisees. The religious leaders, everything they do is for show. They pray for show. They, they sing for show. They, they give their offerings to show off. He said everything they do is for public consumption. And, he, and God hated that. He said they're hypocrites. And, and, and so what happens today is people are using social media to show off their spirituality. Stop it. I mean, if you go and, and let's, let's just say I, I go and I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a picture of me having a quiet time. And I'm going to spend time alone with God. And here I am, uh, you know, trying to focus on God. And, <laughs> you know, and, and look at the scripture I'm covering. I, I'm in Habakkuk. I bet you've never read Habakkuk. Okay. And, 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 and I've underlined this verse. And I remember I got my little latte here. And it's a beautiful sunset. And my Bible. And I'm looking so spiritual. <laughs> Click. You, you can't do that. Okay, that's just showing off, all right? I, I want you to write something down. Would you write this sentence down? I can't be in the moment trying to capture the moment. I can't be in the moment while I'm trying to capture a moment. Please, as your pastor, I'm begging you to never take another shot of your quiet time. That's just showing off. And Jesus hates it. You ought to have a quiet time with God every day, but it ought to be between you and God. You will never see a quiet time of me anywhere. Why? Because if I'm focusing, if, if, if all of a sudden my quiet time, I'm taking a picture of it, I'm staging it for production. It's not real. It's not authentic. I'm not focusing on God. I'm focusing on, I wonder if everybody's going to like this on Instagram. And all of a sudden, I've taken the wrong motivation for this. I can't be in the moment while trying to capture a moment. I want to show you a picture up here. Tell me which of these people is really enjoying the moment. It's all these pictures. Of everybody's got their phone out trying to take a shot. And then there's this little old lady here with no camera, just smiling, enjoying. She's the one who's enjoying the moment. Everybody else is trying to capture the moment. And so uh, she's the one who's fully there. This is one of my problems today, is that now wedding photographers have taken over the weddings. And the whole thing's so staged, it's all about now, please stand here, please do this, please stand here. I understand the need for nice pictures. But we can't even have a moment because it's all about the picture. And, and, and who's actually enjoying the moment because it's all being staged for somebody and, and something else. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Be careful. There's that word again. Don't be careless. Be careful. 
Be careful. Don't do your acts of righteousness publicly to be admired by others. If you do, you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. Wow. He said, if I take what I've just done, as a good thing, and I post it on the internet, that's all the reward I'm getting. Because I just lost it. If I did it in secret, in my lifetime, I, I've probably prayed with almost every president in my lifetime. You will never, ever see a picture of me praying with somebody. Or at least somebody important, famous like that. Because what does that do? I, if I wanted to, I could post almost every day a picture of me and a celebrity. What does that do? Does that draw us closer? No. It, it's like, who do you think you are? Well, goody for you. When, when, when you show off, it builds barriers. It doesn't build fellowship. It doesn't draw you closer to anybody. It's like, well, how come your life's so perfect and mine's not? And you get to do exciting things and I don't. No, no. If you want to draw people close to you, do the opposite. Share the problems that Jesus is helping you with. And people go, oh. Well, if God's helping Rick with that problem, then maybe he could help me too. It's the exact opposite of what the world values and what's being posted on there right now. Let me show you a few, few more verses. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who says you're better than others? What do you have that was not given to you? In other words, by God. And if it was given to you by God, why do you brag as if you did not receive it as a gift? Really, I can't brag about anything because any good that's been happening in my life is because God did it in me, for me, through me, to me, or used somebody else to do it with me or to me or for me or through me. And it's really all God. The breath I'm breathing right now is a gift of God. The heart that I have is a gift of God. The brain that I have is a gift of God. The talent that I've used to do something with my life is a gift of God. I had nothing to do with it. It was just put in me by God. So why in the world can I be proud about it? Because it, it's just a gift. And the same thing is true for you. The same thing is true for you. So why we have no real reason to brag except on the goodness of God. The Bible says this on the screen. Galatians 6, 3. If you think you're better than others <clears throat> when you really aren't, you're just deceiving yourself. And one more verse the Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 6. So, be content with who you are. And don't put on airs. What does that mean? Don't show off on, on, on the internet. Don't, don't put on airs. Don't pretend you're somebody you're not. Be content with who you are. Don't put on airs. Just be the real you. God's strong hand is on you. And he'll promote you at the right time. Now see that word promote? A lot of people are using internet, particularly social media, to promote themselves. See how cool I am? See how smart I am? See how attractive I am? See my pretty new clothes? And they're using themselves to promote themselves, thinking that they have to promote themselves. Friends, you don't have to know the key men if you know the man who holds the keys. And if you are a child of God, you're a son of God or a daughter of God, it says he'll promote you at the right time when he knows you're ready. And he can put you at the front of the line any moment, far more than 10 years of self-promotion on the internet. So stop it. God says you can choose. Either you can promote yourself <clears throat> or let me do it. Who do you think will do a better job? I'm inviting you to change the way you look at social media. Let me give you two more. Number five, the fifth hazard is I can get addicted to the approval of others. <clears throat> I can get addicted to the approval of others. <clears throat> now, what is it that makes social media so addicting? I have to go back and check. I have to go back and check. I have to go back and check. This 80 times a day thing of looking at your phone. 80 people aren't phoning you every day. So what are you doing looking at your phone 80 times a day? Well, if it's social media, 
Here's the science behind why it's so addicting. Everybody wants the approval of others. We desperately need and desperately want the approval of others. We all want to be liked. So when you post something on the internet, then you're anxiously waiting, is anybody going to like it? Is anybody going to like it? And so you're waiting with bated breath, is anybody going to like this? And all of a sudden you get a ding, and you get a like, oh, I got a like, I got a like. And what happens is in your brain, it releases dopamine. And then a few minutes later, you get another ding. Oh, I got another like. Ding, ding. I got two more. I got four likes. They like me. They like me. They really like me. Ding, 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 ding. And dopamine is going off in your brain. It's the exact same thing that when they give a rat cocaine, it'll keep going back, going back, going back for another hit, another hit. It's a scientific biological fact that when you get a like, it releases dopamine in your brain, and that can become addicting. And all of a sudden you got, whoa, 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 look at this. Nine people like me. They don't know you. They're, they're, they may be not even speak your language. Uh, they may be a bot, but they, you got nine likes right there. And you then feel good about yourself. And that creates, uh, 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 and here's the problem with this. When, when, you, when we do this, we get more interested in the opinions of people we don't know than the people around us. And we ignore the people around us while we're busy looking at the screen. Let me show you a, a couple of cartoons. Here's a woman with her, I guess her husband or boyfriend, and she says, do you mind if I strap your phone to my forehead so I can pretend you're looking at me when I talk? <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, okay, and then here's another one. <clears throat> Cell phones bring you closer to a person far from you but it takes you away from the one sitting next to you. That's a profound spiritual truth. Cell phones bring you closer to a person far from you, but it takes you away from the one sitting next to you. And you can be sitting at a table with everybody in your family, and you're more interested in what a visitor or a a stranger is thinking and saying than the people who are around you. That's a problem. And if you're going to spend 11 years of your life doing that, that's not going to be very good on your relationships. All right? Let me show you some scriptures. Galatians 1, verse 10. Paul says, am I trying to win the approval of people or the approval of God? Am I trying to be a popular people pleaser? No. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be the servant of Christ. I just talked about this. You gotta choose, am I gonna be a God pleaser or a people pleaser? A Couple of other scriptures. James chapter two, verse one. Dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. They don't have anything to do with your faith. So don't let public opinion decide what you believe. Don't let public opinion decide how you act. Don't let public opinion decide how you feel. Because they're headed in the wrong direction anyway. One more, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 21. Don't pay attention to everything people say. Oh, time out. We need to tattoo that on our arms. Right down there, if you hold your phone like this, tattoo it here on the inside. Don't pay attention to what everybody says. Okay? The Bible says this. Don't pay attention to everything people say. That means you can't pay attention to everything on, on social media or anything else. Or you may hear someone insulting you, uh, for you know that you've insulted others many times. And he says, you know, what you give out, you're going to get back. What you sow, you're going to reap. And he goes, you know, at some point, you're going to say, you've said stuff, and so somebody's going to say something about you, and then it's going to ruin your day. Don't pay attention to everything people say. God says that. God says that. And if I'm constantly looking, what are people saying about me? That's a problem. That's a real problem. <clears throat> you know, this thing about addiction, it was really funny. This week, Josh, my son, uh, sent me an article from Wired Magazine. He knew I was teaching on this. And it was an article defending uh, uh, the internet and, and online and, and all these different things, gaming and social media stuff, saying none of these things are really addicting. <laughs> I'm going... What universe are you on? The guy said, none of these things are really addicting. Do you know anything about dopamine? 
None of these things are really addicting. And then I looked at the bottom and who wrote it? And I said, I know that name. Where do I know that name from? I think he wrote a book. I think I read it about five years ago. And I went back and I went in my library and I found a book by the guy who said none of these things are addicting and he wrote this book five years ago. Hooked, how to build habit forming products. <laughs> I'm going, busted, busted. He had written a book on how do you build, believe me, night and day, advertisers are trying to figure out how to get you hooked. So you'll keep coming back so you keep seeing their ads, you keep seeing their ads. Let me give you one more, one more hazard. I can be distracted from what's most important. If I spend 11 years of my life looking at a screen, a phone screen, a smart screen, I can be distracted. Oh, excuse me just a minute. Yes, hello? No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm preaching right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, I will bring the milk and bread. Bye-bye. Okay. Now, you will pick up a phone anytime, anywhere. And if you allow this little thing to interrupt anything else in your life, this has become your God. If you allow this to interrupt anything, you'll pick it up. Well, I won't say all the things you could pick it up doing, uh, but you could pick it up, it means I really value this more than I value anything else in my life because nothing will keep me from picking up the phone. It's become my God. Who owns the phone? Do you own the phone or does it own you? Who's the master and who's the slave? Which is the tool and which is the owner, the master? If this can interrupt you anytime, then this, this thing is, is running your life. It's running your life. I can allow things to distract me from what's most important. There's an interesting story in the Bible. Uh, Jesus had a friend named Lazarus, and Lazarus had two sisters, uh, Mary and Martha. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived together in a home <clears throat> in, in uh, Bethany. Bethany is a small town near Jerusalem in Israel. Jesus was in Jerusalem. I, 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 I've been to both these cities, of course, and uh, you can walk from Jerusalem to, uh, to Bethany in a half a day. It's just not that far. It's, you can get there. Lazarus got very sick, deathly sick. In fact, he was almost dead. And word was sent to Jesus, Lord, come to our house in Bethany. Because they thought if Jesus gets here, he can heal Lazarus. We know he's healed people before. And uh, Jesus was in Jerusalem. Instead of getting there in a half a day, it took him three days to get there. What was he doing? He's walking around, he's talking to other people, he's ministering to people, something like that. Jesus didn't want to get there to heal Lazarus. He wanted to get there to raise Lazarus from the dead. had died. So finally, after Lazarus dies, he shows up at Mary and Martha's house in Bethany. <clears throat> and as he walks into the house, Mary sits down at the feet of Jesus and just starts listening to him talk. Martha goes, mm, we ought to have a meal. And she gets up and she starts preparing everything. And she's all busy and all, all messed up and, and very flustered and worried. And here's how the story goes in the Bible. Luke chapter 10, verse 40 to 42. Mary sat quietly 
at Jesus' feet, listening to everything he said. Friends, you need to do that every day of your life. You need to sit at Jesus' feet, listening to everything he says. That's called a quiet time. You sit quietly with this book, and you pray, and you read, and you pray, and you read, and, and you do it every day. And you say, God, is there anything you want to tell me today? And you let God speak to you. You check in with the commander-in-chief on a daily basis. Mary sat quietly at Jesus' feet. That's quiet time, listening to everything he said. But Martha was distracted. You might circle that word. She was distracted by all she had to do. And she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. (laughs) Martha's having a pity party. And Jesus, I think Jesus says it like this. Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. You are worried and you're too distracted by many things. But really, Martha, there's only one thing that is truly important, and Mary chose it. If you have an opportunity to look at your phone and your social media or spend time sitting quietly at the feet of Jesus, what are you going to choose? If an average uh, American is spending 3.4 hours a day looking at this, how much time are you spending alone with Jesus? Something's out of whack here. Why do you spend more time with stuff you don't believe than with someone and something you do believe? There might might need to be a realignment in your life of how much input am I getting from the truth that sets me free and how much input am I getting from lives that make me stressed out? 3.4 hours here. I don't know anybody spending 3.4 hours with Jesus Christ every day. Well, that's, that shows in our lifestyle. It shows in how we're doing. I can be distracted from what's most important. Now, that's the negative side. I, I, I want to give you five uh, um, ways to use the phone for the glory of God. So, based on what Pastor Rick's been teaching us, do we need to take a sledgehammer to our cell phones? No. <laughs> No, how do I use it for good? How can I use my smartphone for God's glory? I'm going to share the first few of these, and then Pastor Rick's going to come back and end this message. If you've been around Saddleback for any time, you know that God has given us five purposes to live for. Not eight, not two. The Bible clearly reveals five specific purposes. So my cell phone, my smartphone, how can I use it to fulfill those purposes? This is purpose-driven smartphones, purpose-driven technology, all right? Five things. Number one, we're going to go through these quickly. Number one, you use it to express my worship. I use the technology that God's put in my hands to express my worship. God has not told us where we have to worship. He's told us that we have to worship. And he's also told us the heart we need in worship. Look at what Jesus said about this up on the screen. Jesus taught us that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So that's something I need to take into my life all of my life. Not just once a week when I come to worship, but true worship is in spirit and in truth all through the day, all through my life. Look at this next verse. Proverbs 25 says, all day long I put my hope and trust in you. So because I've got my phone with me all day long, it can help me all day long to put my hope and trust in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. You can use songs. You can listen to songs all throughout the day. You can, in your car, listen to the favorite song you have, turn it up really loud and sing along with it. When I do that, I really think I can sing. I can't sing. But if you put it up really loud, I feel like I can sing, and you should do that. You can find new songs. You can share songs that you're hearing with other people. You go on Spotify and go on Saddleback Worship on Spotify and sing during the week all the songs that we sing on the weekend. Just bring them into your life. You use it to express my worship. Worship is singing, but worship is a lot of other things. Worship is giving. I don't know if you knew that you can actually commit to give, to tithe on your cell phone through our Saddleback site. Is it any greater a commitment if you make it here or you make it on your cell phone? No. It's about your spirit. It's about your heart. It's not where. It's what God's doing in your life. So I use it to express my worship. Number two, I use it to encourage fellowship. To encourage connection with other people. The very thing that can sometimes break connection, our smartphones, we can use it to enhance, to encourage connection. 
Romans 12.10 says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Anytime you honor someone, you are, you are taking delight in something that God takes delight in. And you're encouraging, you're enhancing fellowship. You're strengthening, strengthening fellowship. Social media, it's not a place to show off, as Rick has been telling us. It's a place to show up in other people's lives. And it's a place to show up, especially with encouragement. Because we all need encouragement every day. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage each other and give each other strength. So instead of looking to social media as a place where you can get encouragement, that dose of encouragement that you need, look to it as a place where you can give encouragement to other people. When you feel discouraged throughout the day, let me tell you, let me give you just a prescription. The best thing you can do is look for somebody to encourage. Immediately grab your phone and encourage somebody else. And watch how God multiplies what God wants to do through the fellowship in your life. Third thing you can do is you use it to enhance my spiritual growth. Express my worship, encourage fellowship. And number three, I use it to enhance my spiritual growth. I use it so that I can get closer to Christ on a daily basis. Because I have this with me on a daily basis. Grow, 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in spiritual strength and become better acquainted with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there are so many ways to do this with the technology that God has given to us. So many, hundreds of apps, probably thousands upon thousands of apps and websites that you can go to, places where you can do Bible studies, places where you can value God's word in your life. Proverbs tells us that it's better to much better to have wisdom and a knowledge than to have gold or silver. And when you value God's word in your life, you're valuing spiritual growth in your life. I, I've talked to a lot of people over the years. They struggle with spiritual growth. I think all of us do. And one of the reasons we struggle is we try to grow spiritually based on one day a week. I just come one day a week, I learn it all, and then I'm going to grow spiritually. And it's not going to work. It's like trying to have a meal one day a week, great big meal on the weekend. I starve the rest of the week, and I think I'm going to be physically healthy. With the tools God has given us, you can bring them into your life every day. Things like uh, Daily Hope that Pastor Rick has done. Or Drive Time Devotions that I do that takes you through the Bible 10 minutes a day. Some tools that can help you to grow spiritually. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 119, 37, Keep me from looking at worthless things and let me live by your word. So it's just this choice. Is what I'm looking at now, is it worthless or is it worthwhile? Is it worthwhile for my spiritual growth? And then number four, fourth purpose of life is ministry, so I use it to expand my ministry. I use it to expand my ministry. I start to think of social media as a place where I can serve others. Jesus said I didn't come to be served, but to serve others. So social media is not a place for you to be served. It's a place for you to serve other people. Psalm 116, 12 says, what can I give back to God for all the blessings that he's poured out to me? So what can I give back to others for God's blessings through social media? If I learn something, how can I share it with somebody else? If I read an article that helps me grow, how can I share it with somebody else? Or Rick talked earlier about people who want to argue with you. How can you minister to them? I'll tell you how. You can pray for them. When they want to argue with you, you pray for them. Now, don't tell them you're praying for them because they want to argue with you about that. I just, I'll promise you, <laughs> they will. But you just choose to pray for them and you are ministering to them as you do that. And then the fifth thing you can do, and Rick's going to come and talk to us about this. Write this in with me. Is I use it to extend my witness. I use it to extend my witness. You know, Saddleback has always been 
an early adapter of every technology. When we started using, uh, when fax machines were first came out like in 1980, I think there were like four fax machines in the world, I started a thing called the fax of life. And, and it was a daily devotional for business leaders. We would fax it out 24 hours a day. We, Saddleback was the first church on the internet. 1992, it was long before Internet Explorer, or Netscape, or anything like that. We were using my, uh, uh, FTP and Gopher and, and uh, Mosaic, those of you guys who knew that. Er, we were the first church on the internet. But I have to admit that I was a late adapter to social media because it sounded so self-centered. One of my staff, who was the director of technology at the time for Saddleback Church, pastor here, uh, brilliant guy, he wrote the Microsoft certification test and he was on staff at Saddleback Church, the test that everybody at Microsoft has to take. And um, he, you know, he came to me, he said, Rick, there's this new thing coming out called Twitter. And he goes, it's gonna be a big deal, big platform, you should get on it, you can influence a lot of people. And I said, what does it do? He said, well, in a few sentences, you just tell people what you're doing at that point in your life. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, that sounds like the most narcissistic thing I could ever think of. I just ate a burrito and farted, okay. <laughs> uh, first, why should I tell you? And second, why should you care, okay? All that does is feed the celebrity status kind of stuff that I so despise. I said, you know, I, I don't want people knowing everything I do. They shouldn't care what I do. They should be thinking about their own lives. And, and so I didn't go on it for, for many years. Now, he actually put my name in their reserved account. When I years later went on Twitter, I had 60,000 followers and had never p Twittered anything, <laughs> but tweeted anything. But... Uh, I, 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 what changed my mind about social media, because it just seemed you know, the opposite of it's not about you. Because social media is so much, it's all about you. And I'm going, I, I'm not interested in that kind of channel. But I went up and I was doing a funeral for a very well-known Christian leader, uh, and I was doing it up in Pasadena, and the other pastor who was doing the funeral with me was a guy named John Piper, a very well-known pastor from the East Coast. John's one of the most humble guys I've ever known in my life, certainly not on any kind of ego, self-promotion uh, idea. And he leans over to me while we're on stage, he goes, at the funeral, he goes, Rick, I'm on Twitter. I looked at him and go, you gotta be kidding me. Because <laughs> it didn't just fit his personality. I said, what in the world are you doing that? He said, I use it to mentor people. Ding, the light goes on, and I go, that I can do. I, I, you will never see me with a picture of a celebrity on Twitter. You will never see me posting my little latte and stuff like that. Uh, what I do is I use social media to encourage people. Like well, a recent tweet I did, I said, sometimes God removes people from your life for your own protection. Don't run after them. A lot of people needed that. A lot of people needed that. And that's the kind of thing you can do. Now the fifth thing you can do, as, he, as Tom said, is this extends your witness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 18 and 20, through Christ, God has made peace between us and himself. And he gave us the work of telling everyone about the peace we can have with him. That's called witnessing. Gave us the work of telling everybody else about the peace we can have with God. So we have been sent out to speak for Christ. Look at the next verse. First Chronicles 16, 24. Publish God's glorious deeds among every nation. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Now, friends, you and I have an advantage over every other Christian who's lived for 2,000 years. You and I have an advantage over every believer who's ever lived throughout history. We have a tool that literally can go all around the world. Jesus said, go make disciples of every nation. Who was he talking to you? You. Every single believer, if you're a believer, you are to be a witness. You are to be an ambassador. You are to share what you know about your life with the whole world. Now, for 2,000 years, to go to the whole world mean, meant you had to get on a steamship and go for six months to travel to another country to tell somebody. Or, in recent years, get on a plane and travel around the world to tell somebody about the good news of the Lord. Today... 
you don't have to leave your home. You can sit at home in your bedroom, in your PJs, and say a good word about the Lord, and it goes to the entire globe. That is a benefit, a blessing, and a responsibility we have no other Christians have ever had in history. You can talk to the whole world. You can be a witness to the whole world through social media. Jesus said, you will be my witness. If you do it on Twitter, you will be my twitness. So God wants all of us to be witnesses, to be witnesses of the whole world. And you can do this. You can do this. So this weekend, I'm starting a new ministry at Saddleback Church. And I don't have any fancy name for it, clever term yet. So we're just going to call it Rick's team. I want you on my team. And if you have a smartphone and you know how to post to social media, or you don't, I can teach you how to do it. I want you to sign up for Rick's team for the next 90 days. And here's what we're going to do. If you'll sign up, I will send you on my team every day something to send to the whole world. The good news of the whole, of of the gospel to the whole world. And if 3,000 people do it, we're going to jump, drop a big rock in, in the social media. I don't know that any church has ever done this intentionally before. So we're gonna probably be the first to actually get 3,000 people in the church to send the same thing out. Lives will be changed. People's lives will be permanently altered. Marriages will be saved. Kids will get off drugs. All kinds of things will happen. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Now, you don't have to, maybe you say, I've never talked to anybody about the Lord. You talk on social media about everything. (laughs) You can do this too. So what I want you to do, uh, you can let me know that you're gonna join my team one of two ways. You can take out a card right now, there in in front of you, and write Rick's team on it and drop it in. I'll get in touch with you, give me your email or give me your phone number, text. Or up here, you can text. If you got your phone right now, text Rick's team, R-I-C-K-S-T-E-A-M, Rick's team to 99000. Text Rick's team to 99,000. And I'm going to have 3,000 of you for the next 90 days. We are going to invade the internet with good news, not bad news. We're going inter- inter- to inter- in- invade social media. And uh, we can do this together. Are you with me on this? Let's do this. Let's do this together. All right. I want to recommend a couple of books. Uh, This book, 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You, by Tony Renke. It's by Crossway Books. Terrific, unbelievably important book. And this book, The TechWise Family, by Andy Crouch, printed by Baker, and how to to prepare your family for technology. If I had taught what was in these two books, we'd be here a whole lot longer. Uh, But I didn't say anything in these books, so these are well worth reading. Let's bow our heads. Would you pray, say, God, I want to be a disciple in the digital age. I don't want to waste precious time, the time of my life. I don't want to be seduced by the world's values. I want to be a God pleaser, not a people pleaser. I don't want to be drawn into unproductive arguments Help me to not be tempted to compete and show off. I don't want to be addicted to the approval of others. And I don't want to be distracted from what's most important. So God, help me to use my phone to express my worship all day long. Help me to use my phone to encourage fellowship, to to look for people to encourage and show love to and to honor others. Help me to use my phone to enhance my spiritual growth, to listen to good messages, to read good material, to, to buy good Christian solid books. 
to listen to drive time devotions as we go through the Bible together as a church. Help me to use my phone to expand my ministry. And when I'm discouraged, to look for other people to encourage and to offer a helping hand to those who need comfort. And Lord, I want you to use me to extend my witness. I wanna publish the good news. And when I get to heaven, I wanna hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. You, You shared the good news with other people around the world. And so I commit to doing that today. In your name, I pray. If you're not a believer, if you haven't opened your life to Christ, say, Jesus Christ, come into my life today. I want to know you. I want to learn to trust you and love you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you, everybody.